Well, let's go ahead and start. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank um, um, Children's for um, giving a dedicated time for the uh, yearly World um, AIDS Day uh, Grand Rounds. It is a World AIDS Day today. This tradition was established by Dr. Lawrence D'Angelo in the room, who really uh, fathered um, that very great tradition for us getting together around the 1st of December and talking about everything from global epidemics to what's happening in our city. <clears throat> and um, today we're really honored because of some scheduling issues. We actually ended up being <laughs> doing a grand rounds and being here together on the 1st of December, which is a World AIDS Day. I can say celebrate it because I think there are good things and bad things, good things that we made a progress, bad things that we still don't have full, fully contained epidemic, and it still costs a lot. And I want to start by just remind everybody very basic statistics. We did tailor epidemics to some degree that it's remaining flat. It is currently estimated 36.7 million people are living with HIV in the world, and it is estimated that since the time that the epidemic started, 78 million people have been infected with HIV and 35 million have died. We have less children now uh, living with HIV on Earth. It's 1.8 million. It's slightly under 2 million. We have made good strides with getting the medicine to pregnant women and men. We have made good strides, particularly in the last year with the PEPFAR, President Emergency Fund, by preventing infection in young women. However, epidemic is still high on the map. It still disproportionately affects women of childbearing age and adolescents who are dying at much higher rate than any other population that's living with HIV. And we still are facing a very hefty price tag. We have been able to cover 15 million people with treatment by 2015, but in order to double that number by 2020, we need to open our pockets for about $24 billion, and it's a huge task to do. So. As we gather here today, we want to acknowledge, yes, we made good strides. Yes, we have much more efficient medicine. Yes, we have now one pill once a day option that is affordable. It costs only $75 a year for patient care, but we still are far from really controlling the epidemic. So with this general statistics, I'd like to really tell you I'm thrilled to have our speaker today. Dr. Amanda Castell, for me, just Amanda, besides being a great colleague, a really great friend, um, and just give you a few words about Amanda's work and, 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 and introducing her talk on the DC epidemic and DC cohort. Amanda is a, a tenured associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at George Washington University, Milken School Institute of School of Public Health. She's a very experienced um, uh, physician, but the most important thing is in addition to all her research and all the other roles that also she's a pediatrician, <laughs> which places her very dear to our heart. Amanda graduated at University of Pennsylvania and did her residency at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which we all hold in a very high standard. She also did CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service and Preventive Medicine Residency Program and also obtained her MPH degree from John Hopkins University. So you see she's extremely well trained, very well exposed over years to the topic of HIV in public health. Um, she is also an attending, um, volunteer attending at the SIS Special Immunology uh, Program with Infectious Disease Department here, and we have a pleasure of hosting her in a clinic, and our patients know her very well. In terms of the research in Novartis, and I think I'm on this a remarkable career in, a, in a, uh, being a very young uh, faculty still. She runs a very large observational cohort study of people living with HIV in Washington, D.C., which she will talk to you today about. She has run multiple public health surveillance data to monitor uh, progress along the HIV care cascade, along with the Department of Health in D.C. She's also very interested in how to retain people in care. She uh, and uh, our clinics, both mine and Dr. D'Angelo, has collaborated with her on technology, introducing technology and gaming into the uh, maintaining adherence and retaining care of young people. And recently she started really very interesting and exciting research looking at file dynamics to describe transmission patterns within HIV. As you can see, her portfolio is very diverse, very interesting, very modern. And I'm very pleased also to say that she also, in addition of her roles with 
faculty and university, co-chairs of the American Committee um, uh, of American Academy of Pediatrics uh, Public Health Special Interest Group, and she also is a member of National Institutes of Health AIDS Research Advisory Committee, sitting with people like Anthony Fauci and really bringing a very important insight in how structuring fund HIV research in the United States. With that, I'd like to invite Amanda and Tahir. It is a great pleasure to have you here today with us. Thanks, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for that kind introduction. I did want to, before I jump into my presentation, just to tack on to what you were saying, Natella, we really have come a long way in this epidemic. Um, I put up here the first MMWR that was published in 1981 that really alerted us to the fact that there was something going on in our population that would now be called HIV and AIDS. And of course, if you fast forward, we have learned a tremendous amount about HIV, about the epidemic, and how to control it. Um, but we still have a long way to go, as, as you pointed out with um, some of the statistics this morning. I also was, you know, if you work in this field, you just know that December 1st is World AIDS Day. Um, but I like this image, one, because, well, first of all, World AIDS Day was actually founded in 1988. It first was um, initiated, and the idea was to be able to commemorate all the people who have lost their lives to HIV, but also to stop and take a moment to try to increase our collective knowledge about the epidemic and to educate people. And so hopefully through the presentation today, you all will get some of that um, education and be galvanized to help continue to fight this epidemic. I also wanted to just give a couple of shout outs um, because this is my second home away from GW at the School of Public Health. So of course, Dr. Rachmanina, Dr. D'Angelo, Kim, I know Keetra's not here, Tani, um, all of the research staff that help keep me grounded in my pediatric care as it relates to HIV and also in our collective fight towards the epidemic. So thank you all, um, and thank you for inviting me. So as Natella mentioned, um, the global epidemic is still pretty severe. There are over 36 million people living with HIV um, globally. And if you drill down to the United States, there are an estimated 1.1 million people living with HIV. Um, if you think about it, again, we are 36 plus years into the epidemic, but CDC still estimates that there are about 40,000 new infections just in the United States alone. So again, there's still a lot of work to do. If you look at the epidemic in DC, and you go back to 2007 when we really started um, honing in and trying to get a better sense of what was happening with HIV here, you can see the prevalence in 2007 was about 15,000 people estimated to be living with HIV just here in the District of Columbia. And if you look at the distribution by age, you can see that the highest prevalence was really among people who were 40 to 49 years old and 50 to 59 years old, so probably people who were um, infected and diagnosed back in the early 80s. If you fast forward to the most recent data that the Health Department has put out, you can see that the prevalence has gone down, um, and that's for a variety of reasons, um, but also that the overall prevalence has gone down tremendously. So in 2007, the prevalence was about 3%, and now we estimate it's about 1.9%. Um, I don't know if you all can see the black bar at the bottom there, but that 1% line is what UNAIDS considers to be a generalized epidemic. That's when they say HIV is really throughout the population. It's not affecting any particular subpopulations. So again, in 2007, we were three times that rate, and still in 2016, we're about two times that rate. So really everyone in the District of Columbia is at risk for HIV and really needs to know about how to prevent it and how to provide care and treatment for people who are infected. So over the next um, uh, several minutes, I want to um, help you understand how we've used partnerships to address the epidemic here in D.C., talk a little bit more about the epidemiology of the epidemic in D.C., including the key populations and what we think might be driving the epidemic, and then um, hone in and focus on some of the efforts that we're doing collectively to monitor and assess HIV care and treatment here in the city. 
So building research partnerships. Um, this has really been instrumental in our ability to fight the epidemic here in D.C. And as you can see from this, uh, this wheel, there are a lot of different partnerships in play. You start with the community, there are academic partnerships, both here in D.C. and beyond D.C. We have partnerships with clinical providers, the federal government, as well as with the health department. And I'm going to give you examples of all these different partnerships and how they've helped us to address the epidemic. And you'll see that throughout my talk, there's this underlying theme of our collective action to address HIV here. So the first was a local partnership that was established between the D.C. Department of Health and George Washington University. This was established back in 2006. And there are really two core components to this partnership. One is to provide um, what we call core HIV surveillance uh, support to the health department. And um, I was actually hired at GW to start doing this. I basically lived at the health department um, and helped them determine what was going on with the epidemic, looking at their surveillance data, et cetera. Um, now Dr. Rupal Doshi is our faculty member who is kind of the embedded person over there. We have a full-time programmer, and we also have opportunities for graduate students as well. And our role really through GW has been to assist the health department in the day-to-day -day management, help them publish annual um, surveillance reports, and then help use some of the surveillance data not only to get a sense of the um, magnitude of the epidemic here, but also to get information out and use um, surveillance data in a scientific manner. The other core activity is National HIV Behavioral Surveillance. This is actually a CDC-funded um, surveillance system that focuses on three high-risk populations, men who have sex with men, injection drug users, and high-risk heterosexuals. And that's also run by two of my colleagues, Dr. Irene Coe and Dr. Manya Magnus, in conjunction with the health department. They have a full research staff and a team. You may have seen them. They have a van that they drive around um, where they go and they do testing at different venues and do surveys among these high-risk populations. Similarly, they help the health department get information out, and HBS really gives us a sense of what are the behaviors antecedent to HIV um, infection, um, what are the prevention behaviors that people are engaging in, and gives us a window into the epidemic that core surveillance doesn't necessarily give us. The second really key partnership has been a federal partnership between the health department and NIH. This is the Partnership for AIDS Progress, or what we call the PFAP for short. Um, uh, it was launched in 2008 by um, Dr. Fauci and then Mayor Fenty of D.C. And this really came to light after the data were published in 2007 showing the severity of the epidemic here. There was a call to action to say, how could we be ignoring the epidemic? How could NIH be ignoring the epidemic in their own backyard and giving money to other cities and, and states and other countries without really looking in and addressing the epidemic in the nation's capital? So the goal has been to promote HIV research that would decrease HIV infections and improve care in Washington, D.C. And there are many initiatives that are supported through the PFAP that are led by Dr. Henry Mazur primarily and he's at NIH in the extramural division. So one of those initiatives through the PFAP has been to get uh, HIV prevention research funding. Um, GW has, uh, through the PFAP, uh, competed for an HPTN clinical research site. And um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but just to give you a sense of the different types of HPTN studies that are going on, um, a second initiative under the PFAP was the Testing and Linkage to Care Plus study, which I know people here at Children's were involved in. Um, but you can see that the studies have been looking at the incidence of HIV among key populations and really looking at prevention interventions such as pre-exposure prophylaxis and how they might um, help us to curtail the epidemic. Um, another partnership that I'll talk more about in the, um, in the presentation is with clinical providers, and that's the DC cohort. Um, the DC cohort is helping us to define the epidemiology of HIV care and treatment here in DC. Um, the overall objective is to monitor and improve the quality of care delivery. Uh, it's a study where we merge electronic medical records from 15 clinical sites. We have about 8,500 people enrolled in the study. And every month, we get electronic transfers of data into a central registry. And then every six months, we link that data with health department data to improve the accuracy both of our cohort data as well as the surveillance data. 
So we've had many initiatives um, kind of underway, um, but um, I'll talk about more of these uh, later, but focusing on HIV indicators and providing data to clinicians, molecular epidemiology to look at transmission, and then you can see a variety of different um, uh, analyses that have been published. Again, I'll, I'll go through these later in the talk. So here um, is just a quick snapshot of our enrollment. This is as of the end of August. Um, and you can see the different sites across the bottom. Um, we do have a wide variety of sites that participate in the cohort. These range from small community-based clinics to large community-based clinics like Unity and Whitman Walker, um, all of the major academic institutions. Um, and our most recent site that we added is Kaiser Permanente. Um, as far as partnerships from an academic standpoint, um, the DC Center for AIDS Research was funded in 2010. Um, this is actually a citywide initiative to improve HIV, um, to bring HIV researchers to the DC area, obviously to address the epidemic. You can see here that it's a multi-institutional effort. Um, Children's is one of our partners in that. Um, the center is housed at GW, and it's one of 17 centers throughout the United States that do this type of work. And through the CIFAR, we've also been able to expand our collaborations outside of D.C. Um, we recently started what we call the Mid-Atlantic uh, CIFAR Consortium, so we're working with um, our colleagues at Johns Hopkins as well as at University of Pennsylvania, understanding that the epidemic is not just contained here in D.C., that people move up and down the mid-Atlantic region, and there may be some synergies um, between our epidemics. And so working collaboratively, we feel like we may actually um, make more progress and get further in addressing the epidemic. So these are just a couple of examples of how that MAC collaboration is going. And then finally, here's just an example of where those partnerships are, are really broad and now they are um, international. So um, Doug Nixon from GW was recently funded to um, lead a Martin Delaney uh, Collaboratory, which is an NIH collaboration to cure HIV. Um, and he is working obviously with individuals throughout the United States, but also with colleagues in Mexico, in uh, Canada, as well as in Brazil. So an example of, of really the broad reaching um, types of strategic partnerships that we're using to address the epidemic. And then last but not least, of course, is our community. They have been really instrumental in um, helping us understand uh, the impact of the epidemic on particular subpopulations, how to um, design and implement our research studies. So we have multiple community advisory boards um, at, at, for different studies and at different institutions. Um, for the cohort, for example, they have provided uh, in-depth um, input into how we design the study, how we recruit people, and how we disseminate information as well. <coughs> So given all of those different um, partnerships and collaborations, um, I want to show you a little bit about where we are now with the epidemic in D.C. So these are data that come from the health department. This is from their most recent surveillance um, report, which is available online. But I just want to highlight a few things. So first of all, our prevalence um, is about 13,000. So the city took some time to actually look back and see how many people that were diagnosed in D.C. with HIV or AIDS are actually really living here. And hence, you see the numbers have declined a little bit. And again, that's not surprising because we know that people move in and out of the metropolitan area. Um, but I think what's dramatic really is the decrease in the number of new diagnoses. So you can see it from those blue bars that in 2011 we had 720 new diagnoses of HIV and in 2016 the numbers were down to 347. So that's a 52% decrease um, and it shows that we're on the right trajectory to hopefully being able to end the epidemic here in D.C. If you look at the proportion of people living with HIV, um, again, you can see that we have an aging cohort of individuals with HIV. Uh, the highest prevalence is, again, being between those who are 40 and 59 years of age. But then if you look at the new diagnoses by age group, you can see in that top blue bar that most new diagnoses are among people who are 30 to 39 and then 40 to 49. And of course, 
in our younger adult population, we still see um, several, you know, probably 30 to 40 cases in that um, the age group 24 and under um, every year. So a lot of work to be done still in trying to address these, um, these new diagnoses. So what are the risk factors that, are, um, that we're seeing in terms of driving the epidemic? Well, we say that we have a mixed epidemic here in, in Washington. So here you can see that about 40% of new diagnoses are due to men who affect with men um, or men who affect with men and injection drug users. So uh, with black MSM accounting for 26% of those new diagnoses. And then we also see an epidemic where we have a lot of heterosexuals being um, uh, infected with another 25% of heterosexuals, black uh, female heterosexuals and black male uh, heterosexuals being infected. So that gives us a sense of some, uh, somewhat of the leading edge of the epidemic in D.C. So given these improvements uh, in the epidemic, um, again, if you think back to 2007 to where we are now, the city has launched something called the Plan to End HIV. It's a 90-90-90-50 plan, and the idea is that by, 20, by 2020, 90 percent of residents will know their HIV status, 90 percent of those people who know their status will be in treatment, 90 percent of those on treatment will achieve viral suppression, so have a low viral load that's undetectable, and then um, the city also added a 50 percent. They want to try to get a 50 percent reduction in the number of new cases. Um, uh, sorry, new diagnoses by 2020. And so this has really kind of galvanized the city. Again, this plan is available online. It's very comprehensive, but it's helping um, those of us who do research to really drive um, the research that we, that we design and, and really help us to figure out where we can have the most impact. So with that in mind, because those, um, those indicators really are focusing on getting people diagnosed and getting them into care, retaining them in care and getting the viral suppressed, we really are focusing on monitoring and assessing HIV care delivery. And you know, how do we do that? Well, there are definitely lots of measures to be able to assess um, ending the epidemic and, and addressing care and treatment. Um, as you can see, UNA set the 90-90-90 goals, which are basically those that the health department modeled um, their plan after, and many other cities and states are also designing these types of plans. The other way that we use to monitor the epidemic is something called the HIV care continuum. And so that is um, basically looking at people who are diagnosed and following them to um, the point where they are achieving viral suppression. And these are the most recent data from CDC, which show that 85% of people are estimated to be diagnosed with HIV. So again, if you think about it, we have 1.1, almost 1.2 million people living with HIV in the U.S., but only 85% of those people actually know they're infected. 62% um, of them are getting care for their HIV, and then 48% are what we consider to be retained in care. So they're getting regular care with an HIV provider. But then if you look at that last pillar, only 49% are achieving viral suppression. And so this is why this is sometimes called the treatment cascade, because we see this steep drop off over time. So again, think of the 1.1 million people living with HIV in the United States, only half of them are actually achieving our ultimate goal of viral suppression. And so here's the care continuum for, uh, for Washington, D.C. You can see that we're doing a little bit better than the national picture. Um, we are very good with testing and linkage to care. So 98% of people have at least, once they've been diagnosed, touched a care system at least once in D.C. But then when you look at retention, it's a little bit more variable. Um, and then if you look at viral suppression, we're at 63%. So better than the national average, but still not great, um, considering that we want all of these bars to be at 100%. So those are kind of the two frameworks that we use, but there are also a lot of different national standards for monitoring HIV care delivery. So we have guidelines from the Department of Health and Human Services on how to care for people living with HIV who are adults and adolescents, as well as specific pediatric HIV infection guidelines. We have a national strategy um, 
that was launched in 2010, uh, which actually was the first national strategy to address HIV in the United States. And then we have guidance from other institutions such as HRSA, who has um, their HRSA uh, HIV AIDS clinical care measures, as well as the National Institutes of Health, I'm sorry, the Institute of Medicine, which gives us guidance also on how to monitor HIV care in the United States. So we basically use all of this different information and guidance to try to assess where we are here in D.C. So what is the health department doing to try to um, improve care delivery? These are just a couple of examples. Um, they are, in, since 2006, have really done a lot of routine HIV testing expansion, both in clinical and non-clinical settings. They have something called the Red Carpet Entry Program, which basically allows anyone who's newly diagnosed to get immediately uh, linked to HIV care and treatment. They have a comprehensive medical case management program um, to try to provide wraparound services for individuals living with HIV. And then they also have something called the Recapture Blitz. This is an initiative where individuals who are determined to be out of care from their clinical providers um, the health department can take that information, look within their surveillance system, which is representative of the, representative of the entire city, um, determine if that person perhaps is getting care elsewhere, it looks like they've moved outside of D.C., um, perhaps has, has died and the clinic didn't know, or there are people who they don't know what's happened to those individuals. And they can send those names back to the clinics and work with the clinics to try to find those individuals and recapture them and get them back into care. We have called it a blitz because it used to be done once a year um, rather intensively, but given the results that they've been seeing from the recapture blitz, the city is actually pushing to make this a more routine activity. And here on the bottom, the city also has had some award-winning social marketing campaigns that um, are really mostly data-driven from the surveillance data as well as from the national HIV behavioral surveillance data. Um, and so you can see um, for example, that second image um, where they're encouraging people to know where their partner stands. So if you're in a partnership, you need to know your status and your partner needs to know his or her status. Um, in the middle is that uh, red carpet entry program. And then I'm sure you all have seen many of the billboards out there at the Metro and um, there are even radio ads because we found out also that people didn't even know that they could, that HIV was treatable and that there was, there were programs like ADAP where they could get free medication. So just increasing awareness of those um, available resources has actually resulted in increased in enrollment, increased enrollment in, in various programs. And then lastly, this new initiative, which um, I'm sure some of you have heard about, is this U equals U. So this is that the idea that if a person is HIV infected and in care and their viral load is undetectable, that there is no, basically no risk of transmission to their partners. So undetectable equals untransmittable. And you'll see that various agencies and organizations um, are starting to really promote this U equals U um, uh, thinking behind HIV care and treatment. So I'm going to finish my talk by talking about how the DC cohort is really trying to use the resources available to us to monitor the quality of HIV care in the district. As I mentioned before, this is a longitudinal observational cohort of people who are living with HIV and getting care in DC. So we do have about 25% of our um, participants who are getting care in Maryland, Virginia, or outside of the district but come in to DC for their care. It's the idea that we're building this public health database of these individuals and we collect really comprehensive information on them, ranging from their treatments as they relate to HIV or other conditions, all diagnoses that they um, receive while in care, lab results, um, and any procedures that they may undergo while they're at that clinic. As I mentioned, it's a citywide initiative. Um, we have to date 15 academic community and government clinics. Uh, the data are uploaded regularly. Um, the fact that they're uh, uploaded electronically at most of the sites really helps us to collect a robust and large amount of data. Um, and we have about 35 to 40 new participants every month enrolling in the study. Um, we, as I mentioned, have about 8,400 people in the study, but we think we'll probably end up with about 10,000 um, at the uh, total enrollment. 
And then, again, in this theme of keeping uh, partnerships going, the study is conducted in close collaboration with the health department. Again, we send data from the cohort to the health department. Um, uh, they link that data. They are able to um, update information that we, we may be missing in the clinical record, um, as well as we can give them information that they may not have through surveillance reporting. And we're able to match our registries not only for HIV, but also for STDs and eventually for hepatitis and, and, um, and tuberculosis. So what do people look like in the cohort? They actually look like the population of people living with HIV in D.C., which is good for us. We have a representative sample. Um, we do have, as I mentioned earlier, kind of an, an aging cohort. Um, most people have been infected with HIV for over 13 years. Uh, the vast majority are ARV exposed. You can see that only about 6% are AR, ARV naive at enrollment. Um, CD4 counts, um, the median CD4 count at the time of enrollment is over 500, which is great, and the median viral load also is undetectable. So again, these are people who are coming into care. They have to touch the care system to get enrolled in the study in the first place, so we do recognize that they may not represent people, obviously, who are out of care sporadically getting their HIV care. Um, and then I want to highlight at the bottom here the comorbidities, because the idea behind the cohort is not only to improve their HIV care, but to also look at some of the comorbid conditions that individuals are living with. So you can see here that 20% of our population have depression or some other mental health diagnosis, about 14% have hepatitis C co-infection, and another 4% have hepatitis B co-infection. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how we're using the data. So one is um, a student of ours who's a doctoral student looked at the prevalence of metabolic conditions among the cohort, um, and we were um, somewhat surprised to see these high numbers. So about 50% of our population have hypertension, uh, another 35% are obese, and another 48% have dyslipidemia. And if you look across the board at uh, individuals having at least one of these, or, sorry, one or more of these conditions, about 46% have multimorbidity. So we realize, um, and we're kind of uh, diving into the data a little bit more to look at some of these different conditions uh, in additional detail. We also, because we're able to link with the health department, have been able to really refine the care continuum um, for people uh, living with HIV and who are in the cohort. So one of the unique things that we're able to do is we can, through that match with the health department, determine the number of sites where people are getting care. You would think that people are getting their HIV primary care at one site. That's probably is the general assumption. But if you actually look at where they're getting their care, there are about 23% of people who are getting some type of HIV-related care at um, two or more sites. And there are, as you can see, 8% of people who are basically shopping around and getting HIV care at multiple places. And we wanted to know, well, what's the impact of that if you look at the care continuum? And if you look here, you can see that um, the, based on the number of sites where somebody's getting care, that the, the higher the number of sites where a person gets care, the lower their viral suppression. And so this is an indication to us that there's some fragmented care taking place here and that we need to work on maybe better case management, um, providing comprehensive services so that people don't feel the need to go to multiple um, clinics throughout the city. We also have been able to look at disparities in viral suppression. Um, so we've been able to look at whether there are uh, age disparities, racial ethnic disparities, disparities related to having some of these comorbid conditions. Here I'm showing you just some trends in viral suppression over time. So on that very top bar, um, the solid black line is the percentage of people who are on antiretrovirals at various six-month six points. Um, and you can see that the vast majority, as I mentioned before, of people are on antiretroviral therapy. But that dotted line underneath shows the percentage of people who are suppressed. That's also relatively high, about 80 to 90%. And then that red dotted line is what is most concerning to us. So those are individuals who, at that six-month point in time, had a viral load over 100,000 copies. And that ranged from about 20 to 25% depending on the period of time that you looked at. And those are extremely high viral loads. And again, if you're thinking about quality of care, we want people, we want our providers to be able to go back and say, what's going on with those individuals? Are they on antiretrovirals? If they are, why are they not suppressed? 
And um, of course, those people are at risk for transmitting virus to other individuals as well. So it's an opportunity to um, really educate patients and talk about the importance of viral suppression also as a prevention, me uh, prevention measure. Um, again, just showing you examples, we collect pretty comprehensive information on the ARV regimens that patients take, and so we can look at the different classes of uh, regimens, but also, importantly, we can look at resistance. So we collect all of the genotypes and phenotypes on patients as well as uh, molecular sequence data, and so we can monitor trends in drug resistance over time and look at things. Um, for the example, for example, perhaps there's the emergence of integrase resistance. Um, with the cohort, we're able to really track that on a local level. Um, I wanted to highlight a few other analyses that have taken place. One was led by Dr. Rachmanina, um, looking at interruptions in antiretroviral therapy here at Children's. Um, and so the idea was to look at the impact on clinical outcomes. And I think probably not surprisingly, among the 28% of participants who uh, did have treatment interruption, the median CD4 count was lower for those individuals, the viral loads were higher, and again, giving us an indication that we really need to focus on different strategies to improve treatment continuity in this particular subpopulation living with HIV. Similarly, at the VA, they have a HIV nurse navigation program, and so they were able to look at individuals in the cohort who had been touched by that nurse navigation program and compare those to people who hadn't. Um, the people who received navigation were more likely to, or sorry, less likely to have permanent housing, more likely to be disabled, have detectable viral loads and comorbid conditions. Um, but they did see substantial improvements in the cohort that actually were um, getting services through the navigation program. And again, their CD4 counts went up, their viral loads went down. Um, after about one year. So evidence that integrating this navigation program into their clinical care uh, setting does work to improve um, uh, HIV outcomes among that population. And then um, finally, we're really using the cohort to look at the quality of care over time. So as I mentioned before, the Institute of Medicine and the Department of Health and Human Services have these standards that are used to monitor HIV care and the quality of care. And so we wanted to see, they don't, in these guidelines, they don't give you any benchmarks to achieve. They don't give you goals per se, but we wanted to at least know where we stood so that once we start rolling out different initiatives, we can see if we've seen, if we observe a change in these different indicators. And so in the top half of this graph, you can see that the cohort sites actually do pretty well with respect to monitoring people for HIV, doing regular CD4 testing, regular viral load testing. Um, but when you look at some of the other recommendations, like screening for STIs, that's where we see that um, collectively we're falling short. So only about half of people are getting the recommended screenings for syphilis, only about 25% or a quarter are getting screened for gonorrhea, and then about a third are getting screened for chlamydia. So again, this is important information that we can provide to our providers to say, don't forget that with the HIV care, we also need to address these other potential comorbid conditions. I'm also noticing the housing thing, which is So it's housing instability. Um, so that, yes, and that's actually one of the indicators that's kind of flipped. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a, about 90% uh, of people have stable housing, which is a good thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know, that one always catches people up. <laughs> Um, and then, as Dr. Rachmanina mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're doing that I'm excited about is uh, molecular epidemiology to try to understand HIV transmission dynamics in the city. So through the cohort mechanism um, and through that linkage, we're actually able to get full sequences on individuals who get genotype or phenotype uh, testing through that, through that linkage and uh, with the health department. Um, I realize there's a typo here. We did not get 13,000 lab core sequences. I wish. We, um, we actually got 3,400 uh, lab core sequences, but representing about uh, 1,900 cohort participants. And so we were able to basically pair those sequence data with the clinical data that we had, um, work with our colleagues in computational biology who do the bioinformatics side of this, 
and look at transmission dynamics in DC. And um, it was very interesting. So I'll take you through this um, slide a little bit. The first um, figure is showing you that we were able to look at integrates and then the PR and RT regions. And basically, they look at the different phylodynamic trees to look at the relatedness of the virus, but they can also look at the subtype of the virus. And so we had actually hypothesized that because D.C. is such an international city and we have a lot of immigrants and people moving in and out, that we thought that we might see some a, a higher prevalence of non-B subtypes. But actually, it looks like um, we really are seeing mostly subtype B, which implies that most of the population here was actually infected here um, in the United States, at least, if not uh, in D.C. We're also able to look at clustering of the sequences, the idea being that if you can look at where there are clusters of HIV that are growing, that you can work with your health department providers to go out and actually interrupt transmission. This has been proven to have been done in places like British Columbia and Vancouver, and so we wanted to know if we could identify any clusters here in D.C. So this is, again, just a different type of a cluster analysis in the middle. I just highlighted two of the clusters. One has about seven people in it. The other has about five. But the idea, again, is that we can provide this information back to the health department, and they can go out, identify those people through partner services. Obviously, if you figure out who the infected person is, make sure that that individual is in care and um, talk to their, their partners, test their partners, for HIV as well as other STIs, and if they're positive, then obviously get them in care, but if they're negative, then we can offer them services like pre-exposure prophylaxis. So we're moving forward with that um, conceptually, and hopefully we'll be able to roll that out in the next couple of months. Um, and then lastly, we were able to actually look at where the clusters were when we overlaid them on different uh, areas in D.C. And so we found that when you do this kind of geospatial mapping, that the highest rates of clustering are actually in the areas where there's the highest prevalence. So that's not surprising, but we wanted it to be consistent also. Um, so again, it gives you information as to where kind of these hot spots are occurring throughout the city and among which populations as well. So I've given you a ton of information and data on how we are addressing the epidemic here in D.C., and I want to go back to this question of how are we going to get the city to this goal of 90-90-90-50. Um, and so this is a graph that was done um, with the health department and um, actually um, colleagues through the CIFAR at Howard who did a modeling exercise to figure out what are the interventions that need to be done where are the gaps in order for the city to achieve those goals? And the long and short of it is that we really need to focus on testing, engagement and care, and getting people virally suppressed, but we also need to focus on the other end of the continuum, which is the prevention side as well. So if we can do things like scale up biomedical prevention interventions like PrEP, we can also have a larger impact on preventing new diagnoses in D.C. And so the city is um, expanding the delivery of both post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, they have transitioned their STD clinic to be a health and wellness clinic. Um, and so they are able to deliver PrEP through the clinic. They can give people starter packs and then link them to care so that they can get um, continued PrEP um, outside of the health department. And then, of course, from a research standpoint, we continue to do and engage in some of the HPTN uh, prevention trials. The city also has a um, large condom distribution program. I think it's only the third in the country with New York and Philadelphia where you can um, get free condoms, either pick them up or get them delivered to you. Um, they also continue to support the needle exchange program, which I didn't show you the data, but we've had an 80, over 85% reduction in the number of new infections among injection drug users, which is probably primarily due to the syringe exchange program and harm reduction services. And then finally, you know, with 347 new diagnoses a year, the idea at, um, through the PFAP and the health department really now is that this is a manageable number. When we started working with the health department in 2006, we had over 1,100 new diagnoses per year. 347 is a significant decline, and it also is a number that, you know, with every new case, maybe that should be seen as a sentinel event. 
we were talking about it earlier this week that there's this analogy with um, with the reduction in, in perinatal transmission, right? So any time now that there is a perinatal transmission, it's a very big deal. And so with, uh, with adults, maybe we need to actually take that same approach and say, there is a new diagnosis, all hands on deck, we need to go figure out where was there a missed opportunity for prevention and how can we learn from that case. Um, so we're hoping to be able to do some rapid case investigation with the health department and again expand that phylogynamic research to identify these growing clusters and interrupt transmission. We are definitely using the cohort as a platform for a lot of this work. Um, as I mentioned, we try to look at quality of care, and so um, in October we launched uh, this clinical dashboard for all of our providers. Now they can log in and get a summary um, of aggregate data on different indicators for their population. They can look at their different characteristics, viral suppression, um, engagement in care, STD screenings, et cetera. And then if they want to even look for an individual patient, they can drill down and download that individual patient level data so that if they know that somebody's coming in for a visit tomorrow, that they can say, okay, do I need to go back and do um, any screenings on this individual, for example. And then we're hoping to turn the cohort into what was primarily an observational cohort, really into an interventional cohort. Um, we're looking at uh, potential studies that would improve care coordination, again, based on some of the data we've seen from people hopping around to different sites, improving ARP adherence, which of course will reduce viral suppression, and then also looking at some of the comorbid conditions, so smoking cessation, improving metabolic outcomes, and of course treatment of mental health and substance abuse disorders um, would have a huge impact also, I think, on improving outcomes. So those are some of the things that we're doing. I do want to mention two things. One is obviously I think the ultimate goal um, and uh, high impact work would be around HIV cure research. Um, and so I did want to just highlight again the work that Doug Nixon is doing with Brad Jones, but also that um, they are working with Kath Bullard here at Children's who um, you know, was coming from the oncology side but has really been instrumental in kind of changing our thinking about HIV cure research um, and how to go about it. And then finally, um, there's talk about the role of a vaccine. So um, at our uh, Center for AIDS Research um, annual meeting a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Fauci came and spoke to the group. And I thought it was interesting because uh, in December of 2015, he published an article saying that he basically thought we could end the HIV epidemic um, if we just followed the science. We had all of the tools that we needed. Um, you know, he, I put the quote here, the science is spoken, there can be no excuse for inaction. Um, and then when he talked to us a couple of weeks ago, he changed his tune. And he said that he thought that we really needed an HIV vaccine if we were going to um, really end this the end the epidemic. And, um, you know, I thought it was interesting. I think all of us were really excited about, obviously, the, the um, momentum and, and the improvements in care and treatment, as well as the potential for pre-exposure prophylaxis. But if you think about it, you can understand its rationale. You know, in order to end smallpox or yellow fever or polio, we needed a vaccine. Um, and so um, I think that that's probably the one component that is still missing uh, in addition to cure research uh, to help us get to the end of the epidemic. But in the meantime, um, I do think that we've made a lot of uh, strides here in D.C. I think that the integration of our programmatic work with the health department and the research has really changed the landscape of the epidemic here. We've seen, again, this drastic decline in the number of new diagnoses the growth of our HIV research portfolios, but I still want you all to go home and remember that we have about one new infection a day. And so how, what are we gonna do to, um, to stop those infections? I think that the citywide partnerships have created a strong foundation that's gonna support all of our activities in the future. Um, and also I think that these endeavors have allowed us to really get, get a better sense of how we can monitor the impact of these programs. Um, and assess um, some of the outcomes as well. 
And then I think that we will be using um, different platforms such as the DC cohort to again develop interventions to improve outcomes along the continuum, to improve the quality of care that we are delivering to our HIV infected populations, and ultimately to meet the city's 90-90-90-50 goals. So with that, I am going to end. I just want to acknowledge that I am representing lots of people um, who have collectively worked hard to address the epidemic here in D.C. Um, and I just want to thank you all. I hope that, again, in the spirit of World AIDS Day, that you've at least learned one thing um, and that hopefully we can engage you in our fight to end the epidemic. So thank you. Well, on behalf of children, I want to thank you, Amanda. I think you've given us a very great overview of what's going on in D.C., and you also pointed out to the importance of collaborative effort to address this epidemic. I'm thrilled to be working with you. I know Dr. D'Angelo Clinic has been actively participating. I want to recognize some really prominent researchers in the room. I saw Marine Lyon walking in. We've helped multiple um, networking studies through the country. So just to highlight to everybody, Children's has been engaged in multiple projects, and this is one of the most honorable and interesting projects for us to run, working together with Amanda, but also individual grants throughout the country. We also are carrying the work done in D.C. internationally. Many of you know that I do part-time work for Elizabeth Glacier Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And for example, the Red Carpet Program, we have built a similar program for adolescents in Kenya in the last year, and in today's Telegraph, uh, newspaper of England, which is very widely uh, distributed uh, newspaper. I'm giving an interview about the success of this program. So mm -hmm. taking the model of the um, DC red carpet program, which really rolls carpet, taking it, tailoring it specifically to young people because uh, the incidence of HIV in young populations in Homa Bay County in Kenya is 25 percent. That's new cases, and overall infectivity is very high, and seeing the success of our DC model going internationally is thrilling. And Children's does a lot in this sense. You mentioned condom distribution. For those of you who have not seen, Dr. D'Angelo Clinic distributes condom for many years for free. The two emergency departments, one is United Medical Center and the main campus, along with the overall screening for HIV and STI, is offering free condoms as well. And we're very grateful for children's leadership to support us in that. So really feeling and seeing how much has grown. I do want to recognize before passing the microphone for people questions and comments, the incredible role you played. I do think that Alan and you together, having come to the GW arena, have galvanized the efforts. I think you Thank shoot you. the NIH in the right direction, <laughs> <laughs> pointing them to the backyard, and I just want to recognize your leadership and Alan Greenberg leadership in this, and obviously with the support of NIH, but I think GW has made tremendous strides for this season for the science. So thank you again for thank coming. Thank you, today. my pleasure. Hi, I'm Robin Steinhorn. I'm one of our senior vice presidents here, and I just really want to congratulate you on, on the tremendous impact you've had um, in the district. I'm a neonatologist by training, so, um, so I really appreciated your comments about how it's a really big deal uh, if we identify a newborn with HIV. And that made me think, are we being bold enough with a goal of reducing our new cases by 50% or, or should we make that 92 and what would that take? Is it going to take a vaccine or can we, can we, can we do even better uh, before a vaccine comes on the scene? No, that's a great point. Um, so in putting together the 90-90-90-50 plan, <laughs> um, you know, you want to set goals that you can achieve. So there's there's some of that um, as well. But I agree. I mean, I I think you know it'd be great if we could get 75% reduction. Um, the modeling that was done, you know, didn't take into account obviously a vaccine because we didn't have we don't have a vaccine to really go with. Um, didn't take into account pure research, um, but took into account the available tools that we have. And so um, you know, I, we can get there. I think the scale up of PrEP is huge in, in our ability to being able to achieve that, that goal. Um, so I think we can get there. I think with respect to the perinatal prevention, I didn't mention it, but Anitra Denson, who is a pediatric ID doc, um, her full-time job at the health department is basically to help monitor uh, and track women who are HIV infected who are pregnant. 
um, throughout their pregnancy to try to ensure that they actually don't transmit the virus to their um, to their newborn. So um, I don't know of any other city that has a model that's that intensive around um, perinatal prevention. Obviously, you know, we know that last year there was a case um, that slipped through the cracks, but um, you know, who's to say that maybe there wouldn't have been two or three um, if she hadn't been working so diligently to address that area? And I, I want to, I'm relatively new to DC and I agree that that is, I think that's a real point of pride. So uh, again, my um, my admiration and congratulations. Thank you. And you, you said you, but I really, it's the collective we. I'm, I'm just a spokesperson, so thank you. And Dr. Steinhardt, just to answer your question, there was an IH conference on perinatal transmission in the U.S. Um, held in May 2016, and we are one of the case studies of the success there. And the paper currently has been submitted and under review where the DC model, along with some really disastrous states like Georgia, is in a very bad shape right now with mother-to-child transmission. The case studies are done and we are highlighted with our program and specifically with children's role. Yeah. Time for one more? Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you. What an amazing presentation. Um, you know, I don't, I wanted to follow up on this transmission uh, issue a little bit, and and the the curves showing the drop in transmission locally are are quite impressive, and uh, and yet um, I don't know whether to be excited about that or or, or appalled uh, that we still have one new case uh, a day in the District of Columbia, and then Dr. Kogan and I were doing some math, and I think there's four new cases an hour uh, nationwide if you if you do out right, the math. Right, if you think and, about the yeah, yeah, that's that's. Crazy, it's right? Too many. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So, has there been? And I'm sure I'm very naive to this. Have there been qualitative and quantitative studies within and populations to see what's working uh, to prevent secondary transmission? I, when you gave this sort of continuum of programs, it just seemed like a lot of different things. And and are those all evaluated with respect to their results and sort of a, a classic PDSA like cycle? And and how are those lessons applied and learned? So we've done some work, I just didn't have time to present it, but we've done some work um, at least looking at retention and care among people with HIV to try to understand. So I mentioned the recapture blitz where the, health, the clinic send the list of patients to the provide. I mean, sorry, the provider send a list of patients to the health department. The health department then checks to see who's out of care and sends that list back. And what was happening is that people were just trying to get people back in care, but they weren't systematically asking them what the barriers were. To being in care. So we've done some work trying to actually interview individuals who were either kind of churning in and out of care or who were completely falling out of care um, in the last six to 12 months. Uh, and what happened, what we found was that individuals who were out of care usually engaged in care. They started their antiretrovirals, they started feeling better, and then they thought, why do I need to go back? Um, their provider maybe was auto-refilling their medications, um, their last viral load was undetectable, and then they just kind of drifted off and, and life took over. You know, if you look at the, some of the, the disparities in our population around HIV infection, I mean, these are people who are struggling with other health conditions that they actually can see manifesting on a daily basis. They're dealing with poverty, lack of housing, lack of food you know, employment issues, and so they're kind of dealing with the issues that are more uh, prevalent on a day-to-day -day basis for them than their HIV. Um, so that's one example of where we've been doing some qualitative work to, to try to understand at least what's happening around retention and engagement in care. Um, you know, I don't know that there's been systematic work looking at what of all these interventions works the best, um, but that's a great suggestion. You know, to maybe figure out what has the most impact. We're also moving toward the injectables. So we are realizing that asking people to take lifelong treatment for something they don't daily feel is really eventually a daunting task. And so there's a lot of research going on. And again, I was honored to be part of the uh, per invitation IH meeting a couple of weeks ago, right? Was it um, a LEAP meeting? There's an initiative led by Hopkins on injectables, and there was a big consultation with FDA about where and for which populations should we develop them. There are currently two drugs injectable formulation in the phase three, I believe, mm -hmm. already. 
phase three trial in Africa, where one injection of one millimeter to each arm lasts up to two months for virologic suppression. And so it looks like we are recognizing the challenges of global population to stay on treatment lifelong. As Amanda said, right. we all dream about vaccine, but we are moving towards and some really cool modalities where I discuss something like I've never heard even myself, though I have interest in pharmacology, like a plaster with a microneedles that can stay on the skin for three hours and allows you to depot a pretty good amount of the drugs internally and then can be taken off, um, capsules, etc. So we're not yet there, but the whole direction of therapeutic development or pharmacological development is moving toward long-acting drugs on board because it's... And a, vaginal rings also. And vaginal rings, as I'm under, do you want to comment? It's well, just that there have been studies showing that if you can um, have a vaginal ring, ideally it would be a contraceptive ring combined with an ARV, um, but there's been high acceptability in, um, in using that modality for women, obviously. Um, so, you know, that's another potential way that we could improve treatment and really kind of take the onus away from the patients and having to think about their HIV um, as regularly as we need them to right now in terms of taking medication daily. Any more questions, comments from every, anyone? Maureen. Maureen, please. Yeah. <laughs> So my question, I was really surprised that people, uh, physicians aren't testing for STDs. And one of the controversies initially around PrEP was that what you would do is people would take their PrEP and then not use condoms to protect themselves from syphilis and other STDs. Do you have any data to show if there's been an increase in the prevalence of um, or incidence of uh, STDs in D.C. since PrEP has come into existence? No. <laughs> so yes and no. Um, we, so we don't have great numbers of PrEP use in D.C. There are estimates that um, the health department just actually told me earlier this week that they think there are about 2,000 people on PrEP in D.C., which is not a lot of people, considering it's been around since 2012, or FDA approved since 2012. Um, so I can tell you that, that that's the number of people that are estimated to be on PrEP, and then separate from that, I know that the syphilis rates are going up. But whether or not those are among people who are on PrEP, that I can't tell you. There is a study in England was presented last year at Croy that showed significant rise in STDs in MSM community in London, um, Soho region, uh, with the use of PrEP. So there is concern. And so part of the debate around this increase in syphilis that we're seeing and STDs associated with PrEP is, uh, so they also published a paper, I think almost 18 months ago, uh, for Kaiser in San Francisco, which found no seroconversions, but extremely high rates of STIs among MSM who were on PrEP. But the, the issue is that if you look, you will find, right? So normally, these individuals aren't getting screened every three months for an STI. So there's increased screening and therefore probably increased detection, and you have to tease out if it you know, behavioral risk disinhibition, or is it really that they um, are just being detected earlier? All right, any more questions, comments from anyone? Well, I just want to remind everybody, Amanda does come to children's clinic <laughs> regularly, and there are great opportunities also in the DCC far and many initiatives that she leads for those young people who might be interested, and older people, but young and with young to HIV, uh, people who might be interested in going research, there are wonderful opportunities, if I may do a little pitch and pass to you, Amanda, for those who have not had a career in HIV research, there are really great opportunities through DCC4. Yeah, so if you are um, an investigator who wants to transition into HIV, and you don't have to necessarily be young, um, uh, there are pilot awards up to $50,000 to support that transition. Um, and then we also just launched affiliate memberships, so you don't necessarily have to be at a doctoral level or a, a faculty member um, for some of the um, junior investigators or people who are interested in HIV. You can become an affiliate member of the CFAR and you, you know, get all the newsletters and you're able to participate in all the events as well. 
Thank you, Amanda. Again, and those of you who are around, we have been distributing red ribbons. Please, when you see your colleagues, do remind everybody it is a World AIDS Day, and we will do our best to try to stop celebrating it at one point, but there's still years ahead. Thank you very much.